How's everyone doing? Good. Does anyone actually like um, hearing this question? Does anyone actually respond honestly? How's everyone doing? Could be better. Could be fine. See, I'm not a big fan of how are you. Neither am I into its cousins. How's your day? How's your week? How's your summer? See, what I've found is what frustrates me is this question doesn't really lead to a lot of conversations worth remembering unless asked by my therapist, but that's a whole other story. Um, instead, this question sort of leads to something I call verbal volleyball, where to keep the ball from falling, you just have to keep talking. There's no real interest behind any of the questions. It's just two people doing all they can to avoid that dreaded silence. And I get it. That silence is really uncomfortable, because once you reach it, you have to reckon with the idea that between the two of you, it's not really that much of a connection. But it, sometimes I'd, I prefer that silence, because at least it's honest. At least it's not, it saves me energy. Because that whole exchange of empty questions and canned answers, it's so uh, exhausting. It's opposite, though. Uh, a conversation with genuine curiosity and active listening, that's, that's exhilarating. That fills me up. You know that kind of conversation where you, you get lost in a topic and down this labyrinth of different tangents, and before you know it, it's four in the morning, and you've talked about your whole life, but you're not even close to wanting to stop talking because you've found such a precious, solid connection. And uh, the times I've had this con these conversations, I've wondered, how did we get here? And it seems to me these conversations often begin with one good question. And that's what began my journey. I wanted to find out what these questions are. And I started thinking of them and testing them out with friends, on dates, at parties, at events. I was making a lot of documentaries. I would have to sit down with people and get them to open up, and within like half an hour. And so when I would ask something, I could sense that walls are coming down, I'd take note. And within a few years, I'd amassed this whole list of questions that I could use. But I didn't want them to stay up here. I knew the experience was so rewarding that I wanted to share it with other people in a way that's so accessible and easy. So I packaged it into a, a card game. Took 52, whipped up a design on Illustrator, came up with a name, essentially this Trojan horse for better discussions. And uh, that resulted in this. That's a deck of so cards. Um, it's on its label, it says it's a collection of questions for deeper discussions. And it, Came out a few months ago. Side note, thank you to all the Kickstarter backers. This wouldn't be here without you. I'm really grateful. Um, since it came out, I've heard a lot of stories, a lot of feedback. There's this one single mom who would play it with her 13-year-old son, and instead of the whole, how was cool, it was fine, mom, um, he would actually open up about his insecurities. And if you've ever dealt with a teenager, you'd know that's no easy task. Um, there's a story of a girl who would play it on Skype with her best friend across the globe. There was even this one tale of a young man who had played on, on long drives with this young woman. And the more questions they answered, the more they revealed who they actually are, and he would realize that he was getting deeper and deeper in love. Now, unfortunately, that guy has a girlfriend, she has a boyfriend, and I may have indirectly interrupted with the two perfectly fine relationships. I'm just really sorry, and I hope they're okay. <laughs> but such is the power of the question. Now. I can't promise that the same will happen to you. You're not going to fall in love with these questions. Um, that's someone else's talk. And neither can I promise that the collection is in itself perfect. And I can never offer the formula to what a perfect question is, because that doesn't even exist. What I do have, which I think is of equal value, is I've gained a bit of insight on what makes a question flop. So. Let's go back to how are you. So it's not inherently bad. This question is not terrible. It doesn't make you a bad person to ask it. It makes you lazy. No, I'm kidding. Um, the thing with how are you that falls short is that it's so vague. There's a lack of direction. And we have this whole thing where, where um, we have an obsession with options. We have this idea that the more options we have, the happier we'll be. But we fail to realize that Sometimes when you have too many options, it goes against us. 
Think of the last time you went on Netflix and you want to watch something new, so you're browsing in all these different titles, independent documentaries that show everyone's talking about, that one thing whose spoilers you've been avoiding for months, and you're browsing and browsing and browsing, and you can't decide, so you end up watching another episode of Friends. That's sort of um, what happens when you ask, how are you? You ask someone, how are you? And they get all these different avenues, all these adjectives that they could use, and they think and think and think, what could I say? And their brain short circuits, and they go back to what's safe and familiar. I'm good. How about you? And what a shame, because you miss out on something new. You miss out on a story. And that's another problem with these questions. It doesn't prompt a story. It asks for a description, and that's it. But think of the times that, think of how many experiences have been cheapened by the question, how was your trip? Imagine, okay, imagine this. You've just gone on a 60-day trek across Southeast Asia, the kind that leaves you irrevocably changed, enlightened, and have all these different moments. That one time you tried this local dish that you've never had before that blew your stomach to bits but loved it anyway. That one time you mispronounced a word and ended up insulting a family but they invited you to dinner anyway. That one time your heart sank to your toes because you thought you lost your passport and you think you would never be able to go home and you're stuck in that hostel with the old man who clips his toenails right beside you and all these little moments compressed into three tiny, insignificant, forgettable words. It was good, it was fun, it was wild. Now imagine, instead of asking how was your trip, you asked this instead. If you had to take that trip and turn it into a movie, which scenes would definitely make the cut? Now, next time you have a grizzled backpacker friend ask him that question, and you could practically see his eyeballs turn inward to his skull, scanning for all the stories he wants to dole out. Now, it's fun, it's, uh, and it's beautiful, because when you ask someone their story, you, give, you communicate that their story is worth telling. And it's not just the how questions that tend to flop. A question tends to flop if you've encountered it so many times, if it's too common and familiar. Let's take the question, What's your type? Now, clap your hands if you've asked or answered this question. All right, and there are all these common answers, like I'm into someone spontaneous and someone ambitious. But there's one that's more common than all of them. Now, clap your hands if you've answered this question with, I don't really have a type. <laughs> See, I don't really think that's necessarily true, because then there's another way of framing this question. I would ask, What's a common trait shared by everyone you've dated? All of a sudden, you have this way to an answer. And it's simple, it's very, it's just a slight shift, and you give this direction, it's the way you frame it, all of a sudden there's, a, there's another path, not the beaten track, there's a path. You take, you take these breadcrumbs and you sprinkle it down away. Now, speaking of sprinkles, which is my favorite segue, um, speaking of sprinkles, there's this one question I've found in a lot of these articles that go, 20 different fun questions to bring to your next party. And stuff like that, these icebreaker collections. And this question goes like this. If you were a cup of frozen yogurt, what toppings would you have? <laughs> cool, how, how fun, how quirky. I've never, <laughs> I've never thought about that before. But you know what, there's, there's a reason. There's a reason that you've never thought about that before. And that's because there's never any reason to think about that. Because that question has no meaning, has no relevance, reveals nothing about who you are, except for your favorite toppings, maybe. And it has as much depth as a cup of frozen yogurt. <laughs> and in the end, you know, it's, it's the conversational equivalent of uh, the worst kind of topping, which is candy sprinkles, and where it promises substance and flavor, but when it comes down to it, it has nothing, and it's purely decorative. So if that's shallow, if that's on that end, on the other end of the spectrum is a kind of question that barges in there with its profundity. Look how deep I am. The kind of question that goes like this. What's your purpose in life? <laughs> Whew, not, feels like a test. I'm supposed to, supposed to make a declaration. It's like a job interview or a police interrogation. But then, see, there's nothing wrong with that topic. There's nothing wrong with that idea. We should think about our purpose. But I think there's a way to arrive in that, in that concept through a more scenic route. I would ask, 
if you were part of a community that bartered instead of using money, what would you contribute? All of a sudden, there's a, it sparks the imagination. You have somewhere to go. If you played it with friends, you could come up with answers for everyone else. And see, you don't have to go too far outside the box, like the Froyo question. Neither do you have to steamroll that box with a purpose question. Sometimes you can just take it, twist it a little bit, and you end up with something familiar and yet new. One of my favorite questions goes like this. At what point did you become aware of the concept of cool, and how did that affect you? And it's a very fun, approachable, benign question. It's familiar. We have somewhere to draw from. We've all encountered cool kids, followed fads that fade. But as simple as the question is, it's brought out discussions of identity, insecurity, bullying, and a whole lot of uh, regrettable haircuts. But what I like about this question is, while it's a discussion on cool, it also gives permission for people to be uncool. Because I've found that sometimes cool is the enemy of connection. And it's in the places where we're supposed to be cool that these bad questions abound. Places like networking events. Anyone been to those? I used to go to a lot of them where I used to live in uh, Los Angeles, which in itself is a giant networking event. <laughs> Typical LA conversation would start like this. What's your name? What do you do? Who do you know? Essentially, who are you? How could you advance my career? And it's very, uh, I mean, it would get people talking, but it's very hollow. It sounds like um, a live reading of LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> and honestly, it's just it's so transactional and lonely. It's not asked out of curiosity, but asked out of this need to categorize people by their use, like tools in a shelf. OK, Tim. Tim is a producer. Does Tim spark joy? I'll put him here. <laughs> so, very utilitarian, very lonely. See, these questions flop because they're asked purely to obtain information and to benefit oneself. But a good question goes beyond obtaining information. It, it goes beyond filling silence. It's about not an exchange of business cards, but an exchange of ideas, insights, stories. It's the experience of getting to know someone and letting yourself be known. It gets past the how are you and into the who are you. Unfortunately, it is hard to avoid these bad questions. And even if you do have these alternatives, it could be intimidating or awkward to ask them. And so a year ago, I started doing this series of events called Beyond Small Talk, wherein when people come in, I tell them from the get-go, while you're here, you're not allowed to talk about work, school, the news, or the weather. Instead, everyone gets a card and goes into small tables, um, and I guide them through three rounds of very intentional interaction. A break from ego and agenda. A chance to get to know one another for the sake of getting to know one another. And I've done this all across the, the globe. In Amsterdam, The Hague, Berlin, Rome, Florence, Tel Aviv, Manila. And in each place, you could see just the spark in people's eyes. And I wish I could take a bunch of you to go in there and eavesdrop on these conversations, because you wouldn't believe they came in as strangers, because now they're confidants, talking about past trauma, deepest desires. This one woman was weeping within the first 10 minutes while everyone else listened to her tale. They found people that didn't just share common interests, but others with whom they resonated. And I would tell them, don't let this stay here. If you found someone that you really connected to, go through the effort of having coffee with them, see them again. Don't let this be an emotional one-night stand. <laughs> and they would follow through. I would get messages, uh, pictures even, of people hanging out weeks after they'd met. And what I love most about this is people come in with this expectation of, oh, I'll have maybe a nice night of good conversation. But they walk away with possibly a lifetime's worth of companionship. And that's what it's all about. See, the goal, the goal is not to be the most clever-sounding conversationalist. It's not to have the most profound, the coolest thoughts and stories. See, a good question is not, it's not supposed to be a pedestal for monologue. We're supposed to build a bridge for dialogue. And when we lose sight of this, that's when a question truly flops. It's a good question. It's not an icebreaker. It's a catalyst for connection.
Thank you.